Saving Union Terminal is paid for by Cincinnati Museum Center and WCPO 9 on your side. My name is Nick Cates, Project Architect, Union Terminal. When I was a kid, we, every once in a while we would drive by it. I remember one time asking what that, you know, what, what's that building? You know, my parents thought it's a train station, but they don't use it anymore. It's really one of the buildings that's instigated my love of architecture. such a beautiful building from the outside all the way to the inside. I'm Steve Kemet. I'm the project executive for the design team. This building is all about the future and all about moving and all about how travel is going to enhance people's lives. So everything was so well thought out. I think that's one of the reasons why people love it, because it's a chance to walk into a building where you have that kind of fine detail that most buildings just don't have anymore. This really does have all the original material. It's a structure that is unlike anything else we have in Cincinnati, and, and people in Cincinnati have always shown an affection for the building like very few others. But in my life, the terminal has been struggling to exist on a very basic do or die kind of level. You know, Cincinnati was really the last major city to build a unified uh, train station or Union Terminal. The situation prior to that was bad in Cincinnati. There were seven railroads that served Cincinnati, but they did so to five separate passenger depots. So depending on which railroad line you were on, you would arrive at a different station. on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and you'd be at a station in one location of the city, then you'd have to take some kind of a cart, you know, horse, buggy, whatever, to a different train station and leave on the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And so I think the, the people that ran the city really, they knew they had a problem. The big breakthrough for construction of Union Terminal came in the 1920s and it came through the efforts of a man named George Dent Krabs. He's the person who eventually got the railroads to sign two critical agreements that paved the way to the construction of Union Terminal. The first was in 1926 he got the railroads to agree to build a unified freight facility and that was followed in 1927 with them signing an agreement to have a unified passenger facility. The construction work began in August of 1929. when Union Terminal had its grand opening. It, it was, of course, uh, a very 
great moment for Cincinnati. It was this thing they'd dreamed about since the 1880s, 1890s finally came to fruition. But there was an interesting incident that I think is important. At the grand opening in 1933, someone, and I think it might have been a reporter, had been inside, was amazed by the building and its facilities, remarked to the president of the B&O Railroad, who was present, he said, oh, this, this is an, an amazing building. People are going to come from all over to see it. And the president of B&O turned to him and he said, yeah, but they'll come by automobile. In this building, it's mostly about conditions. We knew the period of the construction and we knew what kind of construction dated from the 1930s. It's a steel frame, it's got a stone and brick veneer. It was early in that technology of putting together a steel frame and then cladding it. They packed the steel with the brick itself. So as water would get in through this roof area, um, it would get down into this and cause this to, to expand and contract and create what they called pack rust on the steel. We discovered an awful lot in the building. It's probably every challenging aspect to any renovation that probably anybody in this industry has ever seen put all into one building. Everything from basic interior renovation to structural modifications to historical restoration of murals, paintings, flooring, walls, old historic door hardware. It's a chase and that there's a lot of excitement in the chase and then finding these things that fill in the blanks between what you can see in the documents you have, what you can see on the structure, and just learning little things along the way. I mean, it just sort of fills in, it helps you understand a lot of, about sort of what they were doing. We want people, when they see the building, to understand it as it was meant to be constructed. The design of Union Terminal, I think, is an, an interesting story. The uh, New York Railroad architects Feltheimer and Wagner were uh, hired to do the design of the building. And one thing uh, people should know is what you see now, this Art Deco building that everyone is so familiar with is not what they envisioned originally. Originally they designed the terminal to be a neoclassical structure. There were two problems with that. One, I, I don't think that the railroads in the city were really happy with that design. And there was a second and maybe more important reason which is it was expensive to build a building that way. So the Philadelphia architect Paul Cray was brought in and he brought this futuristic modernist approach that talked about the streamlining of design and details and innovation with metals and materials so that's why we have all this stainless steel and all this aluminum and the building's really about the motion. Particularly with, with respect to the way passengers came and went. If you look at the floor patterns, it's in a curving pattern, kind of telling you where, where you should be walking. That's really incredible that the, the, the entire concept is about flow and movement. You don't see that in many other places. All aboard! All aboard! It was designed originally to handle up to about 17,000 people in the building every day coming and going. During World War II, uh, it, it actually handled double that. I mean, you can't even imagine how many trains came into the terminal in those days. That whole area was shoulder to shoulder people. I've never been in a crowd of people like there were in the Union Terminal. It was packed with soldiers and sailors. I had four brothers, three of them were in World War II, and we would go down to the terminal to greet them and say goodbye. It was just a, a happy and sad place to be at the same time. We cried coming when we cried going. At least mother did. They all came back. They all came home to the terminal. We all went down to greet them. And that, of course, was a happy time.
Union Terminal saw uh, its peak usage. But as soon as World War II was over, passenger rail travel was already beginning to decline. We call it freedom of the American road. Freedom to come and go as we please in this big country of ours. There was a growth of the automobiles in the 50s, the construction of the interstate highway system in this country. Airports were built all over the place. Air travel had a big boom after World War II. It wasn't the best time for a passenger train station. I mean, it was built too late. But if you think about that kind of building being in existence in the 1930s, the 40s, the 50s, this was something that was definitely seen as a community asset. My dad uh, had several jobs at the Union Terminal. He shined shoes there, and he worked as a busboy in the restaurant. The biggest memory we have is on Sundays, we would get a Sunday bus pass, and the last stop was at the Union Terminal we would be able to go into the terminal and be able to go to the soda shop and just kind of play in the uh, big foyer that they had. 1946-47 is when my grandmother and I started to come and it was a place to gather, to meet friends, because it was just a place to get away and relax. There was grass, there were bushes, and it was a lot cooler. And we'd go and play in the fountain in the front. The fountain had great big steps where the kids could jump down each step. The fountain was always kind of a stopping point. It has very fond memories. So this is really the, the, the structure for the, the fountain. So one of the big changes here is that originally when this was built, all the piping was below and came up only where it needed to. So that meant there was just tons of piping down inside the building and areas for leaking. So in this case, we kind of rerouted it all and brought it up in one spot right there inside the landscaping and, and ran it all above ground. fountain is magnificent and now we're going back to the original terrazzo and I don't think I don't think people really understand that yet in order to really recognize the difference you kind of have to instead of just squinting you need to close your eyes for a moment and kind of remember what what it has been and what it has seen In a way, the building was in a, in a fight for survival from the beginning. Maybe it didn't seem like a fight at first, but it was something people were aware of, and it continued to be a problem as the uh, terminal moved forward, particularly into the 50s and 60s. It was just this big, iconic structure just sort of sitting there, doing nothing. There was an interesting thing that, that took place at Union Terminal in 1968. There was the opening in 1968 of a science center. Personally, I had so enjoyed the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, I thought, well, maybe Cincinnati could have something like that, too. Well, that evolved in later time into what became the science center. We looked at many different sites that were available around the city of Cincinnati, of which one was the Union Terminal. Now, Union Terminal was still serving as a train station at that time, but 
the number of trains utilizing the building had declined to the point where uh, it was feasible to put this science center in the building and actually have the science center occupy uh, most of the concourse. I remember that my mother took us to some kind of science classes. And my brothers and I, along with my sister, learned a lot about science, and I became a science geek at that point, by the way. Here you had the Union Terminal that the usage was almost over. Here's the potential of the Science Center to bring it back to life. Unfortunately, that Science Center only lasted a couple of years. I think it lasted until 1970 or 71. It didn't make it in the long run. And of course, by 1972, trains ceased operating to the Union Terminal entirely. The Cincinnati Union Terminal had utility, beauty and utility combined, and mixed with the aroma of the romantic era of railroad travel. Like a living thing, it left an indelible mark on the city and on millions of travelers, and died young. The building has been, you know, in danger of demolition more than once. And I think for a, a structure of that type, uh, if the use is not clear and the use is, is, uh, is not fruitful, then you always run the danger of people saying, well, just tear it down and do something else there. In 1971, I was a photographer living in Vermont. My friends urged me to hit the road and take this uh, thing I had about trains and train stations and go look at it all around the country. I hit the road to Indianapolis and I went to the terminal there. The guards at the station said, this place is just mice and rats and spiders. If you want to see a beautiful station, you should go to Cincinnati. When I saw the facade, I said, this is for me, I'm going. And I entered, the, and there it was, the incredible rotunda. It was just so pretty, it was just so beautiful, and the echo. I was stunned that I'd never heard of it. Here was an architectural marvel, 1971, and I had never heard of it. I got out the camera and started taking pictures. I became obsessed with the rotunda. The murals of the uh, westward expansion and the development of the Ohio River. Man, I examined them in great detail. Those are all glass tile mosaic murals. They were designed by Vinald Rice, executed by Ravenna Tile Company. They depict the history of transportation, the history of Cincinnati from the Fort Washington days, the pioneer days, all the way up to the, the modern city, the industrial city. And then if you continue back in, into the concourse when that was still there, you would have seen the 14 worker murals or industrial murals, each of which depicted a Cincinnati area business. I was just immediately taken by it. I wanted to figure out how were they made? Who, who are these <laughs> figures? There are people living that are in that rotunda mural. Roland Johnson is one. He is the baby in the mother's arms. My mother was at a party in, in Brooklyn, New York, and she had a friend there who knew the artist, Vinhold Rice, and the artist was looking for a model. 
I was the right size and shape <laughs> and age. So uh, uh, the artist uh, took a look at me and said, well, I guess he'll do. I mean, I was from New York. I was a New Yorker. I grew up in, in Brooklyn and then in Queens. And so uh, just by happenstance, I came to Cincinnati to uh, further my career. And I was in my early 40s, something like that. And my mother said, uh, well, did you get to the train station? Go look, you know, there's a, a mural of you there. And I was truly amazed. I was totally unaware of uh, what it was or what it looked like. Now I, I feel like I'm a, a permanent part of Cincinnati. <laughs> In the first two or three years of my visits here, the building was intact. So when the last train went out, the Southern Railroad wanted to tear down the concourse. They wanted the space where the 16 tracks were. And there was some talk about maybe the whole facility being demolished. There's a period, say 50 to 75 years, where I think buildings are in a lot of danger because they're just viewed as old. And sometimes it's cheaper to knock them down. There were a lot of people who, who tried very hard to save, save the concourse. Alfred Moore of Chelsea Moore Company took a very strong interest in saving the concourse murals. Well, initially we started a campaign in the newspapers telling about the murals, publicizing them and getting them supported as much as we can. The airport wanted them, and they came to me and asked if they could have them, but they didn't agree to put up any money to give them out. Somebody got the idea that it might help their cause if they got school kids in Cincinnati, elementary school kids, to write letters of support. They wrote these very heartfelt letters to, to Alfred Moore, imploring him to save the, the terminal if he could and to save the concourse if, if he could. When we finally got it, it took a big flatbed truck to take him to the airport. It was an undertaking that today I couldn't imagine how you could do it. Twenty-foot square panels, however tons they are. They were never meant to be moved, and it's amazing that they pulled it off. All the murals were saved except a 70-foot map of America and the two hemispheres. Could not be saved. It was just too big to save it. So unfortunately, that one uh, is gone. But all of the rest of his work is still intact. It's either in the building or it's saved at the airport or at the uh, convention center. But the concourse was ultimately demolished in 1974. That's how long will it take to demolish the concourse? Well, the concourse itself, I would say about three months. What procedure will you use? Uh, cranes and breaking balls, dump trucks and loaders. After the big effort, the city agreed to acquire the terminal, but they didn't know what to do with it. It was vacant. There were sort of reasons to come in and out, but it's just, 
It's, it's, it's hard to imagine how a space like that could be so, so empty. As a person who had been in the building and, and liked the building and had all kinds of interactions in there, I was certainly hoping that something else would, would occur, but I couldn't imagine what else the building could be. At one point, the city actually advertised for, for ideas, offering a, a lease of, I think, $1 a year for an idea that was accepted by the city. Steve Skilkin of the Joseph Skilkin Organization in Columbus was one of the developers who uh, came to the city with this proposal to convert the building into an entertainment complex, which he was going to call the Land of Oz. The original concept was Oz. If you've seen any of the renderings, it has people roller skating, and it has restaurants, and it has shopping, and it has all that sort of stuff. So we put that concept in. So they picked me. Well, as with any development, your, your plans changed. The roller skating went away, but the shopping and the restaurants stayed. So we, we started work on it in 77, 78, some, sometime around there. And I think the tide has turned. I think people now are saying, this really could be a major attraction to downtown. It could be the magnet that we've all looked for. It's a great building. But when we went in, I mean, there were pigeons all over the place. It was, it was a mess. We put a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort into restoring the fountain and restoring all the glass and then cleaning the whole thing up and repainting it and putting all the tenants in. It's millions of dollars. The concept was very sound, very solid. People loved the concept who went there to shop. I was impressed with Lowman's the most. Uh, I enjoyed uh, shopping for the clothes and, and things were, it was really nice. What are you looking for? I'm looking for clothing and I'm looking for goodbye. Can you find a bargain? Certainly. How are their prices? Prices are very good. The problem was, by the time we opened up, interest rates had gone from 6% to 22% the highest in the history of the planet Earth. And at 22%, these new tenants who'd invested a lot of money in their space and everything were really struggling. I'd say probably we've lost a total of about five tenants. As you lose tenants, you start to lose traffic. Lots of people wanted to see it when it opened. Like everybody else, I wanted to go down and see it. So I went down with some friends, we, we went through the shopping center, saw it, it was very exciting and all that. I never went back. I think that maybe is, is kind of a version of what happened with a lot of people. They, they might have gone down there initially to see it, but I think to, to sustain customers coming down when they were competing with suburban shopping malls and all of that. It, it turned out to be a, a, a challenge for, for the shopping center, let's put it that way. It did survive for several years, but it just couldn't, it couldn't survive that huge economic downturn. Well, the mall was going to fail, and we knew it, and, and we got together and we started talking about what we could do. In uh, the 1980s, the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History and Science and the Cincinnati Historical Society had essentially run out of space in their buildings at that time. The two organizations began initially independently looking for new spaces, but pretty quickly uh, it became evident that, that it made sense for the two organizations to look for a single facility that they could both move into, have their expansion space, and, and operate as independent entities. Our original vision was something along the riverfront. And then we hired an architect to explore other possibilities. His name was E. Bernard Johnson. He looked at 35 or 40 sites in the city. I may be wrong with that number, but it's pretty close to that number. 
his summary report shouted Union Terminal from every page. And I was floored. I was afraid. <laughs> Nobody was successful there. Uh, nothing worked there. I couldn't envision it. It was a $75 million project. It, it was, um, you know, it was a pretty frightening proposal. Neither institution had a history of successful fundraising projects. What changed my mind uh, was the first tour through the building. I, I mean, I was staggered by the cavernous <laughs> space available. I, I mean, I began to think, my God, I'm just... <laughs> The, all the opportunity that this building presents. But where am I going to find the money for that? We uh, sat down together and uh, put a timeline and a plan together of things we had to do and sequenced the plan. The end piece of the campaign was a bond tax levy. Now that's when reality set in. Cultural institutions didn't do that. They didn't go before the county and and ask for help. It was not a popular thing to have a bond levy because it's going to increase their property taxes. And why should we keep putting more money into this white elephant? And literally, that was what the opponent said. The day before the um, levy was to be voted on, Frank Weichel, who was an Enquirer uh, columnist, wrote uh, that I must be nuts to think that this levy could possibly pass. It had been an up and down kind of return. I mean, this, this was it for the terminal. The reports would come in and we were ahead, and reports would come in and we were behind, and we didn't know until the very end. 1,200 votes decided it. It was very close. It was very fortunate. To Frank Weichel's uh, credit, uh, the day after it passed, uh, he wrote another column that said, uh, mea culpa, I was really wrong on this one. My belief is that if the levy wouldn't have passed, it, the terminal would not be there today. It probably would have been demolished. The world would look differently in Cincinnati if that hadn't passed. And I do remember what David Phillips told me. David uh, said, well, we did it, looked at me and said, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> that was very prophetic. Now got all the work to do. You know, there was so much at stake. There was huge pressure. Every day for me was, I was either on Mount Everest or Death Valley because some, something had happened in the project that was either really great or really terrible budget increases that we hadn't foreseen, that sort of thing. But we were on time. We made it. It came close to being destroyed by a wrecking ball. But Cincinnati's Union Terminal began its new life today. The new $68 million museum complex at the terminal was dedicated during ceremonies this morning. For the first time in years, water flowed in the beautiful Art Deco fountains that graced the terminal entrance. It's found a purpose. I think the French call it a raison d'etre. I mean, it's got a reason to live now. It was, was the perfect place. It had all of the advantages. It was just delicious. It just allowed you to do, to present the, the, the subject matter in ways that you couldn't do it in a, you know, in a case, in a, in a hall. I mean, you could immerse people in the subject. There's enormous, uh, underground parking garage that covered about 160,000 square feet and that's the area where most of the exhibit construction is going on. We could walk you through a glacier before you walked out on that alluvial plain in front of the glacier and saw the megafauna that was here 10,000 years ago. When it became the museum center is when I really first went inside of it. I was just utterly floored by it. I couldn't believe how amazing it was. You, you would run into people who, would, who were bringing their kids to Museum Center and they would say, oh, I came here, I first came here when I was a kid. And you're thinking, but, but that's what they did. They came in the 1990s, they grew up, they got married, they had kids. You get a whole new generation of people coming into Union Terminal. But we knew that we couldn't do all the things that needed to be done. It was a bit of an experiment in 1989. There had been a lot of renovation, but not restoration. 
It really needed structural steel issues and issues with the exterior of the building and the windows and the systems. That, that had to be addressed for the long-term preservation of the building. When I was mayor, it became clear that there was going to need to be uh, some work done to the building. I actually took a behind-the-scenes tour and saw some of the problems uh, with the substructure. The deterioration was coming fast. I mean, you could put your hands on the wall and it would just in your hands. It doesn't just get a little bit worse, it, it gets worse exponentially. And while there had been a county funding in place that brought in some $3 million for museum center operations, they weren't able to keep up with the exterior. And in order to do that much work on the exterior and do systems, we realized what a great opportunity it was to reinvent the experience. It's overwhelming when you start to really look at what needs to be done versus how much money you need to go out and ask for from the voters. You can see that this building is a beautiful building from the outside, but we're told it will take millions of dollars in repairs to fix what's going on on the inside here at the museum center. That process went on for, I want to say four to five years. We got as much input from as many people as we could. Got their recommendations on how to improve, you know, what we thought needed to happen and what was it going to cost. You know, we basically, we ended at 156 million and we were anywhere from 140 million to 200 million and just a lot of tweaking of the scope and as we went through the process, you know, to get it to that kind of that magic number. We've done all this work now to get the public to say, okay. Passing levies in the city is not an easy task. But it really sailed, and uh, it, it surprised me a little bit. Issue 8 for Union Terminal has passed tonight, so Union Terminal will get refurbished. 60, 64 percent or something like that of people who were so compelled by the history of the building, the stories of the building, and the future of the building. Um, it's remarkable. It was fabulous. It was a lot better than the first one. The great part of this is it means there is an assured future, and it means that this building will be here for centuries in the future. People recognize that we need to keep Union Terminal not just for ourselves, but for future generations of people. And in order to do that, we have to make this big investment that will ensure it will be here for decades to come. Maybe Union Terminal came close to being knocked down at some point. It certainly had fallen into disrepair. But now we've turned that around and we're at the beginning of what I think is the next chapter of Union Terminal history. You see it in kind of phases, you know, there was the initial opening and operation of it as a railroad station, there was the World War II phase, there was the decline of Union Terminal in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there was the shopping center phase. The building has had these saviors uh, every couple of generations. Museum Center did the very same thing, and now us as Hamilton County taxpayers, we're, we've got a hand in this and we're doing it again. just fixing an old friend, we're reinventing it for the future. To see it gain footing like this is something we all should be very proud of. They don't make buildings like that anymore. to preserve and to give us opportunities to really see that building. It's just amazing. I just think there's something 
uh, magnetic about that place. There's something about the building. There's something about the environment. It's so deeply ingrained in our, in our city's culture. It is very significant. It's a significant statement to visit the museums there, which seems to blend in so happily with the, uh, the former uses of the terminal. It, it should endure. If you ask me the question, if Fellheimer and Wagner or Paul Cray or George Dent Krabs were alive today and they saw the building being utilized as a museum center, would they be surprised? And I think the answer is no. Because the building was so big and the way the building was built with its facilities and its layout and so on, I don't think they would be surprised at all that it functions beautifully as a museum. If they came back and saw it as a museum and saw the hundreds, thousands of people coming and going, they would think that was perfectly fitting that the building wound up being used in that way. It's just a wonder, absolute wonder, beyond description. love that building. Saving Union Terminal is paid for by Cincinnati Museum Center and WCPO 9 on your side.